Anyway, let's talk. Let's have the let's talk about the Jones Act. Let's let's get controversial up here. We're gonna have Sal Mercogliano, PhD, he's a professor over at Campbell University. They haven't made me an advisor. They haven't given me an honorary degree, but they're still cool in my book. And we got Captain Adil Ashi, executive at Marine Traffic. Gentlemen, you both look fantastic today. Thank you, Professor Dooner. I appreciate that. I'm on my way. How are you doing, Captain? <laughs> Not bad, not bad. Can't complain. Dog, uh, been annoying me all morning, but I'm ready to talk Jones Act today. <laughs> well, we're going to talk about the Jones Act today. Now, at its very basic, sort of the pro of the Jones Act is it supports American shipbuilding in the merchant marine. The con is that it limits domestic ocean trade in the U.S. due to the high cost. That's certainly a very basic. But before we even get there, because this is an audience that may not even be experienced here, raise your hand if you think you could explain the Jones Act. I see Sal's hand. <laughs> so tell me what the Jones Act is. So the Jones Act, as it's always referred to, is Section 27 of the Merchant Marine Act of 1920, which basically says that if you want to move cargo between two U.S. ports, you have to do it on a U.S. built, U.S. flagged, U.S. owned, and U.S. crewed ship. But it wasn't new in 1920. It had been the law of the land since 1817, and actually in the very first Congress, this concept of coastal cabotage, as it's known as, has been really a precedent that has been part of American shipping. Now, Captain, how does it work in practice? So that's sort of the theory. That's the law. How does this actually work in the real world? Yeah, well, uh, just to add to Sal's comment there, too, the law of cabotage, it's present in over 91 countries. So it's nothing really unique to the U.S., for example. Now, in practice, it helps sustain jobs. There's over 650,000 um people that support the maritime industry within the U.S. and the economic impact of that is it's grand. It's in the billions of dollars. And in practice, this helps, uh, you know, crews have work. This has uh, huge ramifications for environmental standards, safety standards. And it, its main purpose really was to essentially put protections for sailors because back in the day, sailors would be considered wards of state they, they were incapable of taking care of themselves until a point where, you know, injuries, deaths, you have to take care of them. So they defined what a seaman was back in the day and allowed those protections to carry over to the day that we have today where, you know what, something goes on, you're protected, you have rights. Sal, would you agree with what he just said there? Yeah, the Jones Act gets boiled down to the cabotage, but when you look back at what it was originally put together in 1920, it was a holistic piece of legislation. It was dealing not just with coastal uh, shipping, it was dealing with seamen's rights, it was dealing with ship construction, it was dealing with the setting of international rates, uh, it dealt with conferences, what we would today call alliances. It was truly a, a kind of a national maritime strategy. And what has happened in the 103 years since the passage of the Jones Act is a lot of situations have changed. For example, one of the things we didn't have when the Jones Act was passed was interstate uh, highways or interstate pipelines or the use of freight on rail as much as we do today. And that has really substantially caused the big reduction we see in coastal shipping. You don't need to haul a container from Houston to Boston by ship because you can just put it on a rail or truck it that way. And it's usually cheaper and more efficient than going by ship. True, true. I mean, and the way it works, like for people who like aren't like right now, for example, because of the Jones Act, you couldn't have your goods in a factory in Los Angeles uh, or a distribution center. And you're like, oh, no, I need these to go through the Panama Canal and I need them over on the East Coast. You can't just take them from your factory in California, put them on the Maersk vessel that just came in, stopped at the port of L.A. and then is going through. Right. You that that is against law. You can't go port to port. Right. You can't move the goods on a foreign built foreign flag vessel. So we have ships that are U.S. flag, but are foreign built. And so uh, a lot of the Maersk ships, for example, that are U.S. flag cannot do this. They're, what we see is very specialized companies. So companies like Matson that services Hawaii, Pasha, Crowley, OSG. There are a few companies that specify in, in key routes. Uh, oil coming out of the uh, Gulf of Mexico heading to Florida or up to New England. So very specialized, plus a lot of smaller vessels. Again, don't forget the Jones Act applies not just to those, 
but to the inland waterways, to the Mississippi River, to the Great Lakes, to ferries, the Staten Island Ferry, the Washington State Ferries, those all fall under, especially the guys on Deadly's Catch, all come under the Jones Act. But, all right, Captain, when we look at Jones Act shipping, there are no, like, giant U.S. carriers. We don't have, like, the big alliance carriers or anything like that in the United States, despite, like, the amount of imports that and, and exports that we do here. Has it, has it been healthy for U.S. shipping, or has it hurt U.S. shipping over the past hundred and uh, three years? Uh, I mean, that's a complicated question to answer, but, I mean, this problem persists globally, too. But for U.S. shipping itself, um, I mean, when you talk about the different types of commodities, if we're talking container trade, like Sal mentioned, we have carriers like Matson and Pasha that supply U.S. territories. But when we talk about maybe um, commodities, oil tankers, for example, we have U.S. companies who run U.S. flag vessels. So there are there are jobs out there for mariners themselves that they have seven. We have seven maritime academies. We're constantly training out new mariners every year and new marine engineers. And the work is there. And this also applies to, uh, again, as Sal's mentioned, more intercoastal trade on maybe smaller boats, tugs carrying barges that can carry boxes too. So there, there is plenty of um, you know, industry working because of the Jones Act, whereas it could be more detrimental if the Jones Act, in my opinion, gets repealed. Okay, but Sal, look at these numbers. According to the Cato Incident a, a, in, Institute, not incident, the Cato Incident it was a terrible one in history. It said a new U.S. tanker, a, U, a new U.S. built tanker, for example, is estimated to cost uh, 130 million dollars more than one built abroad. That's a serious competitive disadvantage. It sounds like. It is. And you also got to factor in what creates that. I mean, one of the things we saw is back in the 1980s, we ended the idea of what we call differential subsidies. These were uh, basically loans and costs provided by the U.S. government to help offset the higher costs to build in the United States. But you also have to think about the fact that the biggest shipbuilders in the world today, China, Japan, Korea, which build 94 percent of all the world ships from 2010 to 2018, China provided one hundred and thirty two billion dollars in shipbuilding subsidies to lower the costs to build those tankers. Whereas in that same period, whereas China provides $132 billion, the U.S. provided through Title 11 loans $77, not billion, million dollars. And so that's where you see a lot of the cost. It's two, it's two costs in, in particular, Dooner. It is the cost of the vessel and it's the cost of the mariners because we pay a, a kind of a living wage, whereas the minimum wage internationally for mariners is about $22 a day. And this is where you see it. It's one of the reasons why you see countries provide these uh, corporate uh, tax loopholes, these uh, incentives to make it more compatible, or more excuse me, uh, competitive for ships and companies to operate under their flag. Something we've stopped doing in the United States. Why have we stopped? Is is there a reason? It sounds like we're undermining shipbuilding competitiveness here by not supporting it. Uh, does does our country just not find it necessary? Let's go with you, Captain. Well, I or Sal. Go ahead. How about you? No, go ahead. Deal. No, Sal. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, I would argue that we got to the point in the late end of the Cold War where we had this idea that freedom of the seas are the goal. You know, we can use open registries, Panama, Liberia, the Marshall Islands. And, you know, what really mattered was, you know, what do I care who carries my goods as long as I get it really cheap? The problem you're seeing now, and there's a great book by Bruce Jones to rule the waves, where he's talking about this idea that we're seeing global competitiveness arriving again on the oceans. And what we may start seeing is a peer-to-peer -peer conflict or, or competition between nations. And if the U.S. wants to be a true maritime power, it doesn't just need a big navy. It also needs that commercial aspect. It's one of the reasons why you see U.S. Navy shipbuilding costing so much now, because we got out of commercial shipbuilding. Captain, is the Jones Act a matter of national security? 100%. The, its main reason is really it's, it's a service for the country. It's not, as, as we were talking earlier, it's a very complex law. It deals with shipping and shipbuildings and et cetera, et cetera. But its main purpose is the national security and to be prepared for peacetime, support humanitarian efforts, et cetera, or even wartime to support the Navy. 
Um, we have the military slip command. I used to uh, work with them too, and we would trace and follow naval vessels, and we were private essentially, and we would supply and replenish the fleet. So the importance of the Jones Act is more than just saying, you know what, we're stifling innovation and we're so expensive, et cetera. It's, it's a service just like the US Postal Service. It's not supposed to make us money. It's supposed to work for the US citizens. Sal, is it doing that? Is it, is it protecting our national security? Is it working for US citizens? It's it's not working right now. And this is the problem when we need reform. You know, this is the issue I have. There are many in one of those institutes of the one you you sent you cited there. We'll talk about repeal it and rainbows and unicorns. Everything will be fantastic. And I would argue that's not the case at all. What we need to do is reform it. It needed to be kept up. And the problem is we kind of ignored it like we do many other things. We just assumed it'll be fine. It'll work its way out. And it hasn't. You know, you have to ensure that there's cargo to be moved. That means cargo cargo preference. That means incentivizing moving U.S. cargo on U.S. ships. You need to be able to fund and offset the additional cost to build vessels. We can start building ships in the United States tomorrow. Yes, they're going to be expensive because we only build one or two a year. That makes them a work of art. That doesn't make them a ship. Japan, uh, Korea, China do almost assembly line. We have to get back to that point of doing that. And one of the most important things, which is what you do, Dooner and Freightways, is raise this level of attention of how important ocean shipping is to everybody. I would argue that the reason you got the Merchant Marine Act in 1920 was during World War I, all of a sudden, all the foreign shipping that we relied on to move our international shipping went away. And all of a sudden, goods piled up on our docks. And we couldn't export, we couldn't import. Fortunately, we had a coastal fleet that we could put into that role. We don't even have that coastal fleet today. So that should a disruption happen today, we would be in a much worse position than we were 100 years ago. Captain, are you a part of the Jones Act orthodoxy that thinks that it's completely fine as it is, or does it need reform? And if it does, what kind of reform? Yeah, no, great point. It, as Sal mentioned, it does need to be reformed. It, it's a law that was enacted in 1920. There was a 1936 um, kind of an update to it as well. And it needs to speak upon the world that we live in today. I mean, we're, we're more interconnected. Globalization it runs the world. And I believe that if it comes to where reform should take place, I mean, there, there's an instance, for example, nor the Northeast with offshore wind. There's a lot of work going out there. There is an organization that controls out there and make sure to see if there are people that or boats that are compliant. That is one area that we can say, okay, we need some reform rules to allow maybe more assets to come in, build up this offshore fleet. Otherwise, it could take a longer period of time. It may cost more money. So there are, you know, there are some pitfalls for the Jones Act as it currently is, and it does need a refresher. And this is, this is a great time for us to be t talking about this act versus simply just seeing it on you know, maybe national news and someone from the cabinet saying, oh, the Jones Act X, Y, Z. But the problem also is that most individuals in the world, or at least in the U.S., they're not really in tune with what it entails. So more and more dialogue needs to be uh, to had to figure out what is essential and then what can kind of be, you know, kept as is. Like, for example, I would say the protections for mariners. The protections for, well, yeah, obviously you definitely want to protect mariners. You know, most people, you, you made up a good point. Your average American, they're never, your layman, not your seaman, they're never going to hear about the Jones Act unless there's like a big disaster, right? There's something like Maui, for example, or uh, when there's a big earthquake on an island or hurricane season's coming up because we can't send our, our own ships to, uh, to, to these places. Does, Sal, does it impede disaster response? Well, no. I mean, in fact, I, I would argue that the Maui example is a perfect example of that because what you have on the ground in Hawaii is Matson. This is a company that's been around since the 1870s, 1880s, and they have an infrastructure in place to go into Maui, which means that they provide regular service in and out of Hawaii. They have tug and barge service to get you in. As a matter of fact, one of the things they've been able to do is plus up that service. They are actually getting more on the ground. People will tell you, hey, you know, Hawaii is halfway between Asia 
in the United States? Well, first off, you're looking at a flat map. Look at a globe. That's not the way the world looks. Uh, it's not halfway. It's actually way out of the way of most ships transporting. And plus, even if you bring foreign shipping in, and foreign ships do go in and out of Hawaii, but you would need dedicated service in there. And to think that foreign shipping is not going to take advantage of the situation and foreign companies are not going to profit as much as they can off of it is just a misnomer. Matson has a historic relationship with Hawaii. And while there's a lot of relation, a lot of issues we should be talking about, what can we do to offset the higher cost of using U.S. ships and U.S. mariners? That's something that's of national security. That's the issue we should be talking about. How do we incentivize that? How do we lower the cost so it's more cost effective to operate ships with U.S. flag and U.S. cargo. But same thing off Puerto Rico. When Puerto Rico gets hit by a hurricane, the issue with Puerto Rico usually isn't the delivery of diesel fuel, as you heard of a year ago. The issue is the inland distribution. But the problem is people will use any natural disaster to make their case against the Jones Act without fully understanding it. Well, there is a headline on FreightWaves.com right now that says D distribution centers over Maui are overflowing with donations, a lot of those sea lists and air lists, whenever there's a disaster, people bring a ton of stuff. And then all of uh, the responders on the other end say, no, no, stop. Like, just just send money. All these goods become a complete logistical nightmare on our right. end because then we start, we have to become this big distribution center for disaster relief. And a lot of it, it's hard to pair up with people. Would you agree? Like, how is there a better way to manage disasters, Captain? Yeah, so, you know, Tal makes all great points, hits them all. There's a lot of inland trade happening, tugs and barges. That's how you get goods moving from island to island. Um, so what's interesting is that uh, a few years ago, the DOT enacted billions of dollars for developing um, newer, what we call training ships. So the Maritime Academies, you train officers to join the workforce. Now, these officers have to take time and collect sea time. You have to, it's opportunities to learn to actually take the con of the vessel. And we've already started to build out what we call national security multi-purpose or multi-mission vessels. And so we've already started taking delivery of the first one that we should be, I believe, going to SUNY Maritime in New York. And these vessels are purpose-built to support um, you know, issues of humanitarian aid. So for example, I think that once this Lahaina incident occurred, I mean, we had Matson, luckily. We have a lot of individuals that live in Hawaii are very in tune with shipping and moving goods. So it made things really efficient. But I believe that maybe at the federal level, they should have said, you know what, we have this multi-mission vessel. We should utilize it. It should be have sent out to Hawaii. It could be sent out to Puerto Rico. There's another tropical storm brewing in the Atlantic right now. We don't know what's going to happen yet. But there are assets that are there. We just need to have these decisions be taken at the higher federal level, whether it's Mayorad, which is the Maritime Administration, or the DOT, or simply come from Congress or from the White House. So it, it's, it's steered away from the the sexiness that there's an issue. And then again, like some company comes in, wants to take advantage of it, creates a big media buzz versus, hey, let's stop. Let's see what we have. What can we do? And then let's send it out and utilize those resources. So true or false? He mentioned he mentioned government here. Does it fund lobbyists, not innovation, the non-reformed version, the current Jones Act, the way it is? I, you know, I mean, obviously, you're going to have lobbyists no matter what you do. I, th I think one of the big problems we have is that we don't have enough people educated in what the Jones Act, what even maritime shipping does. I mean, you watched it over the past three years. Uh, look what it took to get the Ocean Shipping Reform Act to get some oomph into the Federal Maritime Commission, some uh, an entity that needed to have more administrative power, more oversight than what they had. And unfortunately, you know, there's a lot of groups that oppose the Jones Act and they they fund very big, you know, against it for obvious reasons. Uh, they also do see that there is a, a justification in repealing it because they think it's going to lead to lower shipping costs. 
The problem is all you're going to do is take a look at examples like over in England of P&O ferries. What happened when they reflagged those vessels, they fired the English crews, and the disaster that befell them over there. Again, it, it's not the end-all, be-all solution. And I think the best way to do it is by informing, is by having the maritime academies, by out, uh, outlets like you and Freight Waves talking about this so that people become more familiar with it. Because unfortunately, what fills the airways are those who oppose the Jones Act. They're the ones who write the papers, the think tanks have the money to have somebody sit there and do it. I got to go teach a class. This is, you know, I don't have time to be sitting there writing it all the time. Captain Adil's got his job to do. It's hard for us to really convey the importance of U.S. shipping. I agree. You guys have convinced me. You've convinced me the Jones Act is sort of fine, but it does need reform. Stop listening to uh, these paid white papers. At some of these places, they're not good. Now, let's talk about shipping. Another big issue, one that, um, that talking about ex like exploiting things, getting people fearful, this is one that can get people scared really quick. It's the Panama Canal, the water levels on there. Um, some of the rhetoric around it has gotten a little crazy. Greg Miller wrote a very grounded piece about it last week. Sal, you also said, I don't think this is something to worry about yet. Is that, is that true? Well, you know, Greg made the point that what you're seeing right now is what's not being disrupted right now is containers. That was his big point in that piece. You know, the container shipping is moving through as we see it. However, I, I would caveat one point in Greg's piece is that we are seeing that the container ships, while they're moving through the canal, have to lighten their loads, mm. which means that should all of a sudden demand go up on the east and Gulf Coast, then we're going to have an issue. The real big thing that Greg highlights really well in the, po in, in the point is that the Panama Canal is used almost, I mean, one of the biggest users is the United States, particularly our exports, grain, uh, coal, ore, and most importantly, liquefied natural gas and liquefied petroleum gas. That is what's lining up at the end of the canal on the north end. And if those delays continue, remember what we're seeing is a drop in water levels, which is minimizing draft going through. And the way the canal is handling that is by slowing down passage through the canal, minimizing the number of ships. That could have an impact on our ability to export, creating an energy crisis across the spectrum, not just in the United States, but particularly in Asia. Well, that's some good insight, too. So less volume actually coming through on each ship to get that weight down. Captain, anything to add to that? Sal wrapped it up beautifully. That That is exactly the, the issue. Container shipping, luckily, is not impacted much. They also one of the biggest users. They have a lot of priority. It is the bulk trades, whether it's wet bulk, dry bulk. And, you know, a few days ago, the authority uh, issued, they're going to extend the draft restrictions for an additional 10 months. That puts us into uh, July of next year. And so we don't know what's going to happen. Will it get worse if the rainfall doesn't really come? Sure. And then we'll see the impact. We'll see shortages. Um, we'll probably start seeing a lot of diversions occur, too. And we're already starting to see that happen. Uh, what's interesting, too, is when we look at LNG, for example, there are vessels that just simply are loaded too heavy. And no matter what, they just simply cannot transit the canal. And they're taking a long way around South America. They're adding over two weeks of a transit time. That's more fuel. So could there be increased uh, day rate, as they say, usage for these LNG carriers and tankers? Yes, that can happen. And what would that mean? Well, then consumers will start flipping the bill for those. All right. So keep an eye on that canal. We're not out of the clear yet there. And there's already some activity happening with what's happening there. Now, you guys mentioned China. We talked about their shipbuilding and all of the subsidies. They have a, a modern marvel over there. Show this video. It is the Three Gorges Dam in Yi Chang. Look at this thing. It's kind of weird. Britannica says that when construction on the, of the dam officially began in 1994, it was the largest engineering project in China. That can't be in history, right? This can't be a bigger engineering project than the Great Wall. What do you think, Sal? We need to invest in stuff like this. Do we need to do we need to get to China speed? Well, I mean, China and infrastructure is where the U.S. was in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. You're seeing that. China relies heavily on their inland waterway system, the Yangtze, uh, the Yellow River. All these rivers provide their key transportation. They rely on it kind of like their interstate highway system. So they invest strongly. And also the Three Gorges Dam does a lot for them in terms of power utilization. Yeah. It set a record in 2020. It set a new world record for annual power generation volume through that. You, you like it, Captain? We need more of this stuff? 
I mean, I love it. It makes sense. But, you know, for the U.S., geographically speaking, we're, we're almost a really almost perfect area. We have two, co three coasts, essentially. We have Alaska up in the northwest. Do we really need these things? You know what? Our our inland infrastructure, the rail, the trucking, I mean, it works beautif beautifully for us. Um, there, if there is something to compete with the canal, the most closest or the closest um, canal for us that we could use, uh, Mexico has been working on what's called the Isthmus Project. And for anyone listening, um, I implore, say, go ahead and Google it. It's really interesting. Their uh, key value is to say they have ships kind of get away from the canal, come to their ports, uh, stack the containers down, and we'll rail it to the other ocean. And then another vessel will just simply come pick it up. So that project has been ongoing. It'll be interesting to see how that, uh, you know, kind of takes a chunk of the market share of anything. If carriers decide, you know what, that could be a more efficient approach. Um, but, you know, I think we're, we're just in a really wonderful position as a nation to have so much waterway, so much coastal areas that we don't really need something that as big as the Chinese project. But to see that innovation take place, it is, it is amazing to see. Yeah. Well, hey, Merry Isthmus to them. It looks pretty cool. Now, Sal, take a look at the inside of a car carrier. I want, the, the Maritime Pilot put this out. This was giving you an idea of how many cars are inside some of these things. This one right here is the Harmony Leader. It has 5,000 vehicles over 12 decks. In the news, there has been a, a lot of, there's been a few car fires out there. Sal, anything we should be concerned about? Well, I mean, you look around there real quick and you see how packed that is. Now yeah. imagine one of those vehicles burning, filling up the compartment with smoke, and you as a firefighter going into there, not even knowing that layout, you're looking at the uh, straps on the ground that hold those vehicles in place, all trip hazards, barely able to get between the vehicles. Uh, those straps burn through, and then with a lot of water, those vehicles start to move. This is a really dangerous environment. Again, we're moving a lot of vehicles around the world world in a way never before seen. And unfortunately, the technology is not keeping up for how to put out car fires. And I'm not just talking about EV car fires. Let's be clear. Cars have changed in their manufacturing since the 1990s. And you know, I'm a volunteer firefighter for 20 years. It is tougher and tougher to put out a car. And when you have multiple cars involved, even flooding the compartments with just CO2 isn't enough. And we've seen that with the fire in Newark that killed two Newark firefighters and the Fremantle Highway that killed one of the crew members on board who had to jump off the vessel because the fire got so far out of control they couldn't even launch the lifeboats. Wow. Hey, guys, we are out of time today. You are the GOATs. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Sal, how do people find you? How do they find What's Up With Shipping? Sure. Uh, what's going on with shipping is on YouTube. Uh, feel free to come on over there. Uh, follow me on Twitter at Mercaglio, Mercagliano S. And I am not on an advisory board of anyone, so I'm on like Duna. I'll put in a good word for you, Sal. How about yourself, Captain? You can find me on LinkedIn. You can find me on Twitter, Captain Adil. Um, otherwise, you know what? Lovely being here. Always a pleasure, Duna. Thank you guys for stopping by today. You can find me on Twitter at Timothy Duner. That is D-O-O-N-E-R. You can find the show at FW What the Truck. Subscribe to it wherever you get your podcasts. That's Apple, Spotify, whatever you listen to. Or if you want to watch this in HD live in living color, subscribe to FreightWave's YouTube channel. That is our home. we got a big playlist with our episodes. Hey, thank you all. Take care. Don't be a stranger. And go Big Orange!